Hey, thanks for joining me. Today on hooks and books, <laughs> I wanted to talk about my most favorite reads of 2022, which I've managed somehow to narrow down into my top 10 ranked. I know, I can't believe it either. I also have some stats about my reading that I'd like to share, including how much I saved by using the library. It's my favorite stat, the one I'm most proud of. So grab a project, whether you're working on crochet, knitting, cross stitch, whatever, anything you want. Um, and we're just gonna chat a little bit. I'll be putting timestamps in the description box below in case you wanna skip straight to the top 10 reads. Otherwise, let's just get started. Oh, I'm working on my December blanket or December square from my mental health blanket. So this is what it looks like so far. Very quickly, let's go over some stats. The total number of books that I read this year is 112. That's the most I've ever read in a year. And to be honest, it would have been more, but I cut myself off around Christmas time so that I don't put myself into a reading slump. And so I can start the new year off just like, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a phrase for this, like straight out the gate. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> The total number of pages that I read this year is 3,858 and my average rating was 3.5, which I kind of thought would be higher. Maybe my ratings went a little bit lower in the second half of the year, so. Here's a chart with my age ranges. As you can see, the biggest percentage is adult. Um, and I'm really sad <laughs> about that middle grade percentage because it's lower than I would have liked it to be. For the genre breakdown, my biggest slice was contemporary followed by fantasy. I, I don't know what's happening with me. <laughs> contemporary for sure always used to be my most read genre. And then I think last year it was fantasy. I don't remember, I have to double check on that. So I guess they're just battling it out right now. Those smaller genres are either things like dystopian that I didn't really read a lot of, or things that are a little bit harder to classify, like literary sci-fi. I, I don't know, I just did my best when putting in what genre the book was in my spreadsheet. And then it looks like there were some that were fairly even across the board, like thriller, contemporary fantasy, horror, erotica. <laughs> I do love some smut. And um, romance, which I'm a little bit surprised about because I felt like I wasn't reading a lot of romance this year. As for the formats, um, I track whether I read it physically, ebook, audio, and if it was physically what type, if it was hardcover or paperback. So it looks like I was reading a lot of hardcovers this year. That might be because I was reading a few newer releases and those come out in hardcover first. And then we have the source, which is where I got these books from if I didn't own them already myself. The majority of this is from the library, as you can see. In fact, that library slice is if I physically went to a ranch and picked it up. But the Libby slice is also the library because that's what I used to get um, ebooks and audiobooks through my library card. So if you put those two together, my total library slice or usage is actually 86.6%. I sort of live at my local branch. I cannot pass a library without going in. <laughs> oh, that unlabeled slice is scribbed, by the way. It was only two books that I used scribbed for. And I do want to note that those other sources like Audible or Scribd, I likely didn't pay for either. Um, I usually use free trials or codes or anything like that. So majority of my reading was free. I'm sure even some of the own books were gifts instead. So speaking of which, my favorite stat is the total amount that I saved by using the library. So every time I would check out a book, I would write in the list price for that format. So if I got a hardcover, I would write in the hardcover list price. And if I got a paperback, I would write in the paperback list price. So the total amount that I saved from using the library is $2,068.01. But I also kept track of the manga that I was reading, not super heavily, I just, I, and I'm not sure why, but I track that separately from my regular reading, even though graphic novels are accounted for in that first spreadsheet. Some people track it together. It just makes sense in my head um, to categorize them separately. It's just what works for me. So this year I read 145 volumes. Um, the majority of them were in May. If you were to count that together with the total amount of books, novels, graphic novels, all of that that I read, it would be 257, I believe. Yeah, 257 books read. The total amount that I saved by using the library for manga is $1,735.54, bringing my total between manga and everything else to $3,803.64. Use the library, <laughs> if you can, of course. It's just my preferred method of obtaining books and reading them because it's the only thing that could keep up with my pace of reading. Like I always have to have a book near me. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that number is gonna go down next year because I wanna prioritize books that I own. I did buy books this year. I read, I read, I bought 14 books and I tried calculating 
how much I spent on all 14 because I bought a lot of them secondhand um, and the total was somewhere around $130 like this series that I have behind me right here that was I bought all of those for like $13 or something like that it was no more than 15 for sure and I was gifted some books too so I, I just want to prioritize a little bit more of my owned books next year so that library number is probably going to go down a little bit but I'm sure it's still going to account for the majority of my reading so now let's get into my top 10 books of 2022 at number 10, we have The War Outside by Monica Hesse. This is a historical fiction YA novel about a German girl and Japanese American girl in an internment camp um, and their friendship bond with one another. I read this one in, I think, February, and it really caught me off guard because for one, I don't really read historical fiction most of the time. And I guess it just sort of gave me the idea that I wasn't going to like it as much or that I wouldn't be as into it. I've read majority of it physically but I did also listen to the audiobook which was very good and from the start, like from the very beginning, I knew that this was going to rip my heart out. It starts out with perspectives from these two girls way in the future uh, and then it goes back to their time together in the camp. Prison. <laughs> the thing with this book is that it doesn't outright say that this book is sapphic or that the relationship between these two girls is sapphic but you can definitely interpret that if you want. I for sure did. There was no way that I could read it any other way. Um, it just seemed so apparent to me. The bond that these two had, the ways that they um, thought of each other and related to one another just felt that way to me and somehow that made it all the more painful when certain things happened later on in the book. I spent the last few minutes of that audiobook crying just just sobbing in my living room and saying like why did this book do this to me it's devastating um the writing is devastating it's really beautiful the way that these girls think about each other these women think about each other um even on in the future of course no spoilers or anything like that but i i read the first page or so to my boyfriend after i finished reading it and he was like that was um that was a lot <laughs> It was beautiful, it was very well written, and I'm definitely keen on checking more out from this author in the future. At number 9, we've got Frizzy by Clarabelle Ortega. This is, I think, her first uh, graphic novel um, written in tandem with, I forget the author's name, but it'll be right here on the picture anyway. This is a graphic novel about a girl coming to terms, well, sort of coming to terms with, um, but also like fighting for her hair, her curls, because her family, they, they really want her to straighten out her hair. She hates going to the salon every week to have it straightened and then having to do the upkeep of like making sure that it's not gonna get wet, making sure that you're not moving around too much or playing around too much. It's gonna get frizzy, it's gonna poof up, it's gonna look all messy because you start sweating and then the curls come out the bottom, but the rest of your hair is kind of straight. It's, it's a lot. I'm having flashbacks right now, it's horrible. <laughs> This book hurt. <laughs> um, it hurt, but like in a really good way because I have been struggling with my hair for a long time, my entire life, and I could relate to so much of this graphic novel. Um, the author and the main character are Dominican, and I'm not, but my family's Puerto Rican, and so many of this was familiar to me, so similar. I used to get taken to the salon every weekend also, though definitely not as often because my mom was not as strict on me and my hair as like my grandmother might have been. But I was definitely also scolded for having natural curls, honestly, for things like not tying my hair up or just for looking messy. Um, for playing around and being a kid and getting my hair like wild and everywhere. It's almost I think three years now since I decided to stop straightening my hair, give my curls time to breathe and figure out what my original curl pattern was as a child because I damaged so much of it straightening it my entire life and dyeing it but also like what was important to me was having straight hair and not having curls you know and it sucked <laughs> it sucked a lot but going on this journey the past few years of leaving my hair alone and seeing what I can do with it even now seeing it how much it's grown um, if you don't know at the beginning of the year I shaved my head just to let my curls come in and kind of make peace with my face as weird as that sounds <laughs> so now that I'm at a place where you know I really love my hair it was really good to see a graphic novel about a girl who went through so many of the same things that I did growing up but is still like really fighting for her natural hair, fighting to be seen as she is and to be the most comfortable 
um, in whatever way that she chooses. I wish that I had had this book as a kid. I wish that I had been told not just it's okay to have my hair curly, but that I look fine with it. Like I'm pretty with my hair as it is. There's nothing wrong with curls. They're beautiful as they are. I don't look better with straight hair. I'm trying to convince myself of this every day. <laughs> the book also gave me a chance to talk to my mom about our struggles with our hair. Mom's hair is, uh, coiled a little bit tighter than mine so she definitely got it harder than I did for sure so this was such a lovely graphic novel um, a really nice coming of age then for number eight which is also number seven I'm just gonna put both of them together we have sea of tranquility that's number eight and uh, station 11 that's number seven by Emily st. John Mandel I read station 11 the glass hotel and sea of tranquility this year I liked all of them, I just liked The Glass Hotel less than the other ones. All of, or at least these three of Emily St. John Mandel's books have this like interwoven storyline, this sort of connection of these characters in ways that you wouldn't expect across time and space and it's just so good. Station Eleven is following a traveling Shakespeare performance group after a pandemic has sort of changed the entire landscape of the world. <laughs> Civilization has essentially ended as we know it. And then Sea of Tranquility, I can't even begin to explain the plot to you. Can anybody explain the plot of Sea of Tranquility? Like in one sentence? I doubt it. I, I truly doubt it. But it's more of what I said of like interconnected stories throughout space and time on a greater scale, I think, than Station Eleven and The Glass Hotel. What I loved about these books are the characters, I think you, you kind of fall for all of the characters because they're such character-driven novels. You have to care about them to care about the ways that they intersect with one another. Her writing is so easy to fall into and there are some beautiful quotes that I found in these books, especially Station Eleven. I would love to read more books like these. I mean, I'm definitely gonna try her older books because I just love her writing, but in general, if I could read more books with um, storylines that kind of converge like that or cross over in ways you don't expect, I would love that. I'm, I'm on the lookout for more of that next year. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. And I also watched the show the TV adaptation of Station Eleven this year, which I think I liked more than the book, which is, is saying something because, you know, the book is one of my favorites now, but the show was just adapted so beautifully. There are obviously some changes um, that I think really work out for the show being made in this moment in time and for the viewer of this moment and time. <laughs> Both of them made me cry, although Station Eleven, the show, made me weep, like openly weep. <laughs> it was fantastic it was just incredible for number six i'm not going to talk about this one at length because it's kind of hard for me to for sort of personal reasons but we have the push by ashley audrain this is about a woman who has a baby has a daughter but she just doesn't bond with her and she kind of feels like the daughter hates her like this this little baby hates her and so she's thinking maybe i'm just like cursed as a mother i'm a bad mother i wasn't you know meant to do this but then she has a son and immediately bonds with the sun. And then you also see flashbacks to the main character's mother and also her grandmother and how they sort of experience sort of the same thing of like that, that struggle and that resistance with their daughters. And so it's sort of asking like, is she feeling this way towards her daughter because it's like in the family, it's sort of like a generational curse or a generational trauma, or is this daughter actually bad or she you know she hates her mom in actuality i could not put this book down it's something of a thriller although to me it was more of a i guess a, a study of motherhood and expectations we put on women in regards to motherhood but i could just be saying this because i read several books <laughs> on this topic this year of like just motherhood and expectations of women but i really enjoyed it i cried through a lot of it because there's a lot of uh depictions of childbirth that made me so wildly uncomfortable like that's kind of body horror to me <laughs> um but i i really enjoyed my time reading it um i couldn't put it down i think it did its job as a psychological thriller and that's about all i can say about it for now at number five we have no one is talking about this by patricia lockwood which is such a hard book to explain especially if you're not on twitter <laughs> This follows a woman who logs onto the portal every day, Twitter, and essentially she's just like super online. Like she's super online and it's affecting her life, like having the discourse and all of these 
wild hot takes like the worst hot takes you've ever seen and how it affects her life at first it's fun like why she decides to log in all the time and engage and interact with other people but then it starts to affect her in a negative way how she interacts with the world outside of the portal it's so hard to explain the first half of the book i think might be really jarring to people because it's told in these like really small snippets vignettes i don't know what you want to call them but they essentially read like like twitter shit posts <laughs> You know, that could catch a lot of people off guard and might turn them off from reading the book. But personally, I think the reason that I love this book so much is that it, it came to me at the exact right time. I, this might sound ridiculous, but I talk about this in therapy a lot. Like online, Twitter especially, the, these kinds of spaces really mess me up mentally um, have really affected me in ways that it's so hard to express to other people because they have to be the same amount of online as you are to understand why it's so upsetting you have to kind of explain layers and layers and layers of things to get to the root of one thing if that makes any sense which it probably doesn't i hope it doesn't for your sake <laughs> I hope it doesn't because it means maybe you have a healthier relationship with the current state of the internet than I do But it's really hard and this was the first book that I've ever read or the first instance really of, of Any of this <laughs> that I've ever encountered that made me feel like oh my gosh, I'm not Crazy, you know, I'm I'm lucky enough to have a therapist who understands So when I come to her and I'm like listen this this really bothered me I don't have to peel back as many layers. She she totally gets it I wasn't sure if other people would you know, it makes interacting with other people very difficult um, I don't I don't want to get too into it because I guess we'll be here forever talking about my personal life and mental turmoil but this book just got me, you know, it really got me and sort of framed it in a funnier way, made things more lighthearted and easier to digest for me, and made me feel like it's not <laughs> hopeless, like things are not hopeless right now. Um, so I really, really enjoyed it and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since I read it, which was probably in February. February was a really good, really, really good reading month for me. At number four, we have Acts of Desperation by Megan Nolan, which is about this young woman who falls into a relationship that you would probably call toxic because it was. Um, she is just searching for love and is essentially desperate for it at times and the lengths that she'll go to to um, receive that love, to not be alone, to be loved. It's one of those books that's more, uh, not vibes than plot, but definitely more emotion than plot, more of like a, a character driven thing. I really connected with it because it reminded me so much of my early 20s and some of the things that I went through in my relationships with people. There were things written in that book that the main character expresses that I thought, not necessarily that I'm the only person in the world who's thought this certain thing but i guess i just felt like i could never voice some of these thoughts aloud so it was really refreshing to see um a character be so i don't want to say desperate clamor so much for love and attention and the reasons that she had for it i just felt kind of watched you know i felt like somebody had like examined me throughout my late teens and early 20s and like all of my behaviors and somehow got into my brain and put those thoughts onto paper. In a way it was a little bit scary but then I realized like I can't be the only one feeling like this you know so it's nice to see it put out in such beautiful prose like there, that was another book that there were so many quotes that stood out to me and that hurt me and that I would have to like put the book down to take a breather because I was like wow that was that was gorgeous but also that hurt if you decide to pick this up I feel like I should warn you that I can't remember 100% but I think there might be some assault in the book so we're finally up to my top three which are all books that i own except for this one i mean i own it but my dad is borrowing it right now um but number three is sincerely your autistic child which is a collection of short essays and stories written by other autistic people basically with the theme of what the title says things that they wish that their parents had known about them growing up so i read um several books about autism this year uh, because this was the year that i was finally officially diagnosed after suspecting for at least four or so years i'm so glad that i didn't put off this book because it really gave me the confidence to make adjustments in my life as I feel I needed them, even before that official diagnosis came in. It was so good reading about experiences of other people, of adults 
who wish that their parents had supported them in other ways or want other parents to know what they should or shouldn't do while seeking out an evaluation or a diagnosis for their child, what they can do to best support them. I annotated the shit out of this book. <laughs> I underlined so many parts. I had um, post-its over so many parts. I, I made so many notes. And the first thing that I did when I finished it, besides weep massively, like there were so many stories that really resonated with me and that I felt finally somebody gets it, you know? Or also this is where it's coming from, you know? Or, oh, so I am experiencing this. I thought it was just me. There's so much, once again, getting off track. Anyway, the first thing that I did was text my dad and tell him, if there's one more book that you ever plan on reading in your entire life, I would really appreciate it if it was this one. And he was like, yeah, no problem, I'll read this book. Um, so he's borrowing it right now, but he's not really a reader. Um, so he's had it for a while, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, that's why I don't have it right now to show you. But I'm really thankful that he's taking the time to read it and maybe learn more about me and i'm especially thankful that i took the time to read this book that i have a copy that i can go over and sort of reaffirm myself whenever i need it and that i know that i'm absolutely not alone that i feel whatever i feel and that i have the right to make these adjustments in my life and do what's best for me and my body and my mind and all of that <laughs> suddenly shy. Coming in at number two, which I was planning on putting up here, but like, I don't want to disturb them. So I'll just hold it up really quick and then I'll put a picture up here while I crochet. At number two, we have Lonely Castle in the Mirror by Tsujimura Mizuki. Uh, this is a translated Japanese novel about um, a girl who has been bullied. She's been dealing with bullying at school and has decided to stop going. And then one day her mirror in her bedroom lights up and she finds that she can go through and there's a, a whole castle on the other side and there's other other kids in the castle. There's like a whole mission that they have with the castle, but essentially they can use it as a hangout and an escape if they need to. A lot of them are also uh, lonely or have been bullied or are having some sort of issue in school. It's the story of them sort of learning more about each other and about themselves and there's not a lot more I can say without getting into spoilers. Um, what I will say is that I have a love-hate relationship with translated books because sometimes I feel the translation can be really stilted and strange and can really ruin the experience for me. I also don't like when things are over-explained and that happens a couple of times in this book so I thought I was gonna really go downhill <laughs> with this novel but it didn't turn out that way. I think largely in part to some elements that I really really love um, especially in anime. It reminded me a little bit of Haruhi Suzumiya and uh, what's it called? Bunny Girl Senpai. Like bits of supernatural elements in there or you could call them like sci-fi supernatural, whatever you want to say. That just really, really appeal to me when I'm reading, or reading when I'm watching an anime or reading a manga um, and it worked out really well for me in this book. I can't give you my like favorite parts and like comparisons because I think it would massively spoil the book but I will just say that it's like top 10 favorite stories ever and the movie just came out i think last week or a couple days ago in japan um i don't know when it's going to be available to watch in the u.s or online who's going to be carrying it to watch like streaming uh but i can't wait to watch it i i really can't wait because i loved it so much so much more than i was expecting to and then finally, my number one favorite book of 2022 and probably one of my favorite books of all time now is Brown Girls by Daphne Palasi Andreatis. Um, this is everything to me. I don't know if you can see very well, but I've tabbed it a little bit. It's probably a little hard to see. This is hands down one of the most unique books that I have ever read because I've never read a book told in the same style as this where it's told in the choral voice. So we go here we see this we feel this um it's never i or you or they or by the names of the characters sometimes by the names of the characters but generally um it's told as like many voices in one and i've never really read a book like that before so it's following the lives of young women of color in queens new york if you don't know queens is where i was born and raised it's where i live it's my home of all homes um, I think I'll always have the most love for Queens in my heart, even if New York is not my favorite place in the world. And I think that that setting 
and that focus is why I enjoyed the book so much and why it just dug its way into my heart. Mom and I have talked about like books that she's seen herself in. I think for her it was The House on Mango Street. It was the first time that she she came running to me when she read it and she was like sobbing and telling me like, oh my god, I feel like this book is about me. And you know, I've had moments like that with other books with characters who have shared parts of my background or my personality or things like that. But this book, is the first one that I've read that takes place in Queens and so now now it's it's not just me it's like all of the girls that I grew up with seeing like our high school names the places that we hung out in the bus routes that we took the sights and sounds and smells that we experienced growing up and and the routines that we have that's so uniquely Queens New York was just so much for me I I didn't realize how much that was going to mean to me until I read it you know I've definitely read books that take place in New York before that but they sort of prioritize like Manhattan and sometimes they'll you know give a little love to the other boroughs but to see Queens given such love um, really meant a lot to me and having it told the way that it was told like I said reminded me of all the girls that I grew up with and the things we experienced together when I was reading this book it felt like I was experiencing everything not just through my own eyes but I felt like all of my friends and classmates and everybody that I grew up with was right there beside me and that we were all in this together I felt like I was way less alone and I read this book at a time when I was profoundly lonely <laughs> like um shut in this book made me want to reach out to old friends this book made me want to check up on people i cried so many times while reading it and then i was fortunate enough to meet the author at um a book event i think this book is going to stay with me for a long time um i'm not saying that i would recommend it to everyone because this is such a personal me book i feel that i don't think I would be able to recommend it to everybody but there's definitely a long list of people that I would people in my life people that I think would really get something out of this book I just adored it so much I'm so happy that I read it I'm so glad that I got the chance to meet the author and I'm gonna cry what's happening I'm gonna cry <laughs> The point is that I loved it. So there we have it, my top 10 books of this year. I'm so excited to read for next year. Like I made a library trip yesterday afternoon. I picked up a couple of books. I've, I've got a big pile of library books checked out waiting for me to start out the year. And I'm just so excited to get going on my reading. Um, I miss it so much. It's only been a few days, but reading is my absolute biggest hobby. It's what I spend the most amount of time doing. So kind of hurts that I haven't been doing it for the past few days but it's uh, necessary believe me it's necessary this is how I uh, avoid being super stressed out at the end of the year with trying to trying to read and like end the year on a good note just just end the year just end it <laughs> okay um, I'm gonna end it here I didn't get as much done of this as I wanted I got like one round and then maybe half of the other round but it's all right. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you'd like to share what your favorite book of this year was, top five, top 10, if you could narrow it down, whatever you feel like sharing. If you'd like to leave that down in the comments, feel free. Um, let me know what you're working on if you'd like. Thank you again for being here and I will hopefully see you soon. Bye, take care. Oh, oh, it's almost the new year. Happy new year. Bye.